Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Well, a couple of weeks ago, I, like apparently most other people in the United States, watched the Netflix documentary, Tell Them You Love Me, and I was gobsmacked. I was so interested in it uh, for reasons that we'll talk about. But uh, then I found out that I was lucky enough to have a connection with the director of this really extraordinary and remarkable a documentary, and we have him with us today. So welcome to Nick August Perna. Nick is an award-winning director, producer, and editor whose work has been nominated for the Emmys, the DuPonts, and the Academy Awards. His directorial work aims to present stories that challenge the shape and power of the documentary form to inspire discourse, which I think we're going to have some today, and to build empathy. Uh, His latest feature documentary, Tell Them You Love Me, premiered on Netflix in June uh, in 2024 and was the number one most watched film in America its first week on the platform. So, Nick, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so so much for having me. This is great. Very excited to be here. So let's, uh, because we want to get into this story. It's a rear documentary tells this fascinating story of Anna Stubblefield and uh, it's a it's kind of a complex story. So let's start with you just setting up the story for us. Just kind of give us the the details about what happened. Sure. Uh, so Anna Stumblefield was a um, uh, at the time I believe she was the chair of the philosophy department at Rutgers University in Newark, New Jersey, and she had grown up in the disability space. Which we can talk about more later. Her mother was a Quite a big figure, actually, in the in the seventies and eighties, um, uh, in in bringing down some of the abusive institutions around the country, and um, so she grew up in, in that space, and she uh, incorporated into her own work and wrote about it, and um, along with uh, a focus on race and what she would say, I think, white supremacy and the system of white supremacy. She started infusing some of her philosophy courses with the ethics of of race and of disability. And um, she was teaching a class one day and showed a film about uh, an autistic woman who was using a method called facilitated communication. And uh, this was a woman in the film who was not entirely nonverbal, but she was um, she had a very, very difficult time expressing herself verbally. And the method, uh, the claim of the film was that the method unlocked a very vivid and lucid uh, person who was cognitively intact, somebody who had been given an IQ of about, I think, 21 at the, you know, for her whole life. And um, so you see in, in the film, which is called Autism is a World, and actually I think was nominated for an Academy Award when it was, came out in the 90s, uh, you see this woman sort of being unlocked in front of your eyes using this method of typing on a, on a keyboard. And in Anna's class, when she was showing that film, was a man named John Johnson who uh, had a brother who was nonverbal. And his brother was Derek Johnson. Both John and Derek are in the film. Derek is the other main character in the film. So um, he appro- John approached Anna and said, you know, I have a brother, Derek, who really reminds me of this woman in the film, and he can't speak, and he has cerebral palsy, and um, I wonder if you know anybody that can help you potentially use this method on him, because they're, you know, in John's own words, there were always sort of hints and things that, that would happen throughout uh, their life together, he and his brother, that lend this sort of air of maybe there's something more there, right? Are we missing something? Um, there were moments where he felt his brother was paying attention to conversations or reading over his shoulder when he was at the 
at the barber shop reading the newspaper. And Anna said, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not an expert in it, but I, I, you know, you can, there's places I can send you. And they, after sort of trial and error, she decided, uh, they, they all decided together that she would work with Derek for a bit and see what happened. And so the, uh, what, what happened uh, after that is the sort of the summary is that they worked together for two years and the working relationship of using facilitated communication, this typing method, which is very controversial. Um, she claims to have unlocked him. Uh, she claims that they fell in love with each other. The relationship became sexual. And when the family found out, there was an immediate kind of downfall of, um, of, the, of the story. It took a turn for, and it, it, you know, they, she was charged. Uh, with assault, eventually she was taken to trial, and she was eventually sent to prison uh, and convicted of sexual assault. And so um, I came to the story in 2015. There was uh, a bunch of, kind of smaller articles written about it. And, and, you know, I have some friends in the disability space uh, who who were who were sharing uh, articles about the case, but one amazing article was written called "The Strange Case of Honest Stubblefield" in the New York Times Magazine, and that really captured all the the kind of complicated layers of the story. And I was absolutely riveted and transfixed. And I had a moment where, uh, which doesn't happen very often, where you feel just very deeply, I need to tell this story. Mm. I don't know why yet, but I need to tell this story. There are reasons why, which we can talk about, which I uh, relate to to me and my life, but. Uh, but I immediately wrote her um, in prison. Uh, I went to visit her in the county jail while she was awaiting sentencing. She was facing 40 years in prison at the time. Um, and I met with the Johnsons in Newark. And I slowly, over the course of the next two years, while she was appealing her case, I, I sort of got everybody on board, uh, you know, without a camera. I just visited and I talked and I researched and I did all the work I needed to get myself ready to 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 film it should everybody agree to and to be on camera. And, and, and so eventually they did. And I spent the next few years making the film after that. I mean, you, you obviously had extraordinary degree of trust with both Anna and uh, Daisy and John and, uh, and, and they're all sort of extraordinary people. So yeah. uh, just, I, I'm not sure if you said this and it's important. So I want to make sure it's there. Anna is white. And Derek's family is African American. Correct. So that's that's a layer in here. Yeah, yep. It's a big big layer. Yeah, and there are, there are class differences. You know, um, the, the fact that she's a woman and he's a man, um, and that he's not a child. He's a man, right? Um, mm -hmm. That's that's an important an important note. Uh, it sounds obvious because I think at the, you know now he's in his forties, his early forties. At the time, he was in his uh, early thirties. But people, for some reason, when they hear the story, they think of like a like a teacher student mm -hmm. relationship, and they assume that there is a, a vast age difference, and then that's part of the the ethical, the sort of complicated ethics of it. And in this case, it's it's two adults, right? So that's just mm -hmm. something to, to to make sure people know. You mentioned that there were, um, it you know factors in your own life that made you particularly interested in this. Can you share some of those? Sure. I mean, listen, it's funny when I, I was coming on, if I, I haven't fully mined my own psyche for the reasons why, you know, as an artist, like, why do you get so taken mm -hmm. by one thing over another, you know, and I'm sure that there are all we, kinds of We can give you a referral. I was going to say, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm here to figure that out. Fine. <laughs> well, um, but I did have, I grew up with an uncle who was diagnosed intellectually uh, impaired. And he, at the time, he, he died actually during COVID. He was 65. And at the time uh, of his childhood, there were really no sophisticated diagnoses for people like him. There was no money. There was no medical or, or psychological, uh, you know, um, uh, attention to somebody like him in the way that we do now, it's still quite, quite behind, I think, where we should be. But so the diagnosis was always very, very vague. You know, I mean, th there were institutions at the time of his, uh, he wasn't an institution, but there was the institution at the time of his childhood that, that would place 
severely physically impaired people, people who were visually impaired, people who had severe intellectual impairments, uh, you know, people who were criminally, you know, insane is, is what they called it. Everybody was kind of like in the same room at some of these mm -hmm. institutions because uh, it was just this monolithic category of, of otherness, of disability, you know, and, and we have since evolved, thank God, from that point where we're now, you know, we're gaining much more of an understanding for the, the very unique um, thing that every disability is, and not just that, but how the way that it affects each person, each unique person, right? So it's just um, the sort of neurodiversity, which is now a, a term that didn't even exist, I don't think, during his childhood, uh, is now opening up all kinds of doors and for how to understand people. But at the time, he, he was just labeled intellectually impaired, and he grew up in a group home, and uh, as a kid, I, I found him mysterious. He had a big laugh, you know, that, that was, I, I thought was kind of funny and strange and maybe even scared me at times. And, you know, he, he, uh, he had an incredible memory that was vivid. We'd be, um, you know, sitting around the, the, com the table at Thanksgiving trying to recall a fishing trip in Wisconsin from 1985, you know, and, and he would chime in from the other room, uh, the, 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 the fish that we, we caught, you know, at that particular day. So I was also aware that there were things in his, his mind that were incredibly active, incredibly vivid, and, and that, um, you know, he, he was a mystery, right? And this story really awakened this kind of moment, did I, did I miss something? And, oh my God, what if we miss something? And you start to sort of take on the burden of unpacking maybe your own accountability for this other person that you've grown up with that, um, you know, might have had more going on, you know, whatever, whatever that might mean. And, uh, and I remember when I told my mother about the story, um, she got very defensive right away. She was very, very nervous that I was accusing her of something right away. And that was not my tone or my intention at all. I don't think that is that would have come across in any way. It was pure curiosity at the time, but she immediately dropped into this space in herself that was, oh my God, please don't tell me I did something wrong mm. you know, as, his, as his sister growing up. Please don't do that to me right now. That was really what I felt from her. And I think that emotional kind of vulnerability in the family members of people like my uncle Donald or Derek in the story is is a very very intense part of what uh, energizes the the kind of hope you know that that um, then can potentially get preyed upon uh, if we're not careful and um, it's it's a driver of of how reality gets shaped you know around other people especially when they can't communicate in the way that we're used to communicating with each other right we we uh, it opens up so much space for projecting those hopes and um you know even if there is reason for it are they the you know are they the right hopes are we are we are we asking for the right things of that person or are we just hoping that um you know uh, there's there's a sil silver bullet that will will reveal them to us you know in a way that we haven't seen and so that we you know can have uh can can have that hope confirmed um so all of these all of these forces get unleashed, particularly with this with this method, which is uh, very powerful in all kinds of different ways. That's almost its own conversation. Um, so well, let's let's go there for a minute because I think it sets up a lot. To let's just talk a little bit more about facilitated communication, which was not something I'd even heard of before I watched your film, but apparently it was developed in Australia. And, uh, and it, it involves, I mean, there are images of it in the film, which it's, it's good to be able to see it, but it's almost like, you know, different versions, but there's some, there's some, the facilitator is sort of maybe holding the other, supporting the other person's arm or maybe holding up a keyboard. There's sort of different versions of it, but, but there's, uh, usually the, the facilitator is in physical contact with a person who is typing. So, so in, uh, in, in Anna's case, she and Derek kind of started having these very rudimentary 
conversations where she would, you know, ask him a question and he would give a kind of one word answer. And the spellings were very, as she put it, kind of creative. But eventually they're having these longer conversations. So she would speak to him when we say conversations, she might speak to him, I'm assuming, and then help him type back the answer. And Right. So she she would say, right, she was supporting him so that he could he could type right back the answer. So so the right, the origin, you're right, was was a uh, in Australia there was a woman named Rosemary Crossley who's in the film who's considered the pioneer of the method. And there's a sort of extraordinary story um, that she has with a young woman named Anne McDonald, who was in an institution in um, I think Melbourne. And uh, it was a, the description, uh, Rosemary wrote a book called Annie's Coming Out, and the description of the institution is quite horrible, but not uncommon uh, around the world. Um, you know, she found Annie sort of, I think, on a, on, a, on a dirty mattress kind of shoved under a staircase when she first met her, you know, and just kind of, um, she had a lot of involuntary neurological movements and um, she could not feed herself. So Rosemary describes uh, what the nurses would do, which was called like, bird feeding, where they would kind of, you know, hold her over their, 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 their thigh and just kind of drop things into her mouth. And, and it would not always make it into her mouth. So, you know, she would get it all over her face and they would barely clean her up. And, you know, from, from that to, various kinds of just actual physical abuse and, and things that were going on at the time. So she uh, worked with this woman, Anne um, McDonald, using this method, facilitated communication, and um, claims that, you know, Anne was a completely vivid and lucid person that was trapped in this body and that she should not be in the institution. And they actually won, a, I believe, a, whatever the Supreme Court, you know, uh, is, in, is in Australia, they won the case and got Anne uh, out of the institution. And Anne spent the next 30 years living with Rosemary Crossley, and they used the method. Now, some people question whether or not uh, the validity of this, of this, of this, um, of her intelligence, of, of, uh, of what occurred between them, that's its own story because she she passed what's called a double blind test in the courtroom and and so there's you know this very real pot we can talk about the double blind test later but um so but that's that was such an inspiring story is my point it was like a sea change in the disability movement and there were so suddenly she was doing conferences all around the world and people were showing up from all different countries and there was a conference in Sweden where all of the you know the top people in the in the field you know met and watched watched uh, rosemary you know uh, unlock people right and and describe um the training method and uh, a man named Doug Bicklin was so taken by it he brought rosemary back to Syracuse University in uh, 1990 i believe and did a huge conference about it and it created a movement, you know, in the disability field where people then went to all corners of the country and began practicing this method. And there were stories of people being unlocked uh, all over the country. You know, there were stories of, of uh, you know, um, uh, the fa fathers with their, with their daughters who were now, you know, the daughter was writing poetry and had, you know, was publishing volumes of, of poetry and short stories about, about her life. And, you know, these were just such extraordinary um, things to be hearing about. And, and especially if you were somebody that had a, a, a you know, person with disability in your family, a nonverbal person. And um, to get back to the sort of specifics of, of, your, of, your, of your point, the idea is that, um, you know, many people with involuntary neurological, and, and I'm, I want to say very clear, I'm not an expert in this field. This is what I've learned. And I, you know, I'll only say what I sort of feel pretty confident saying, but there, there, there's an experience where people kind of feel that they're floating in space, right? Because of the, the neurology and that they need to feel grounded in some way in order to focus on the on the keyboard and get the get the writing out and the words and so the theory is that with just a little bit of of touch which is both physical and emotional support um the the uh, nonverbal person can then um type their thoughts 
and express themselves because they feel grounded, they feel supported, they feel confident, they uh, don't feel rushed, right? They don't feel rushed. That's a big thing as well. So, um, so that's what Anna was doing with Derek. And, and, and it, originally it's called facilitated communication training because the idea was always, okay, let's, even if you have to start with support with your hand on their finger, the idea is to eventually move up the arm to the wrist and then further up to the elbow and then up to the shoulder. And ideally, you are then uh, not touching them and they are on their own typing without support. And that is what they, you know, everybody that I talked to in the field say that is the goal of facilitated communication is to get to that point. And they'll admittedly, they will all say it does not happen very often, but that it does happen. Mm -hmm. I, I can imagine that it does happen. But, but I think it's also good background to have that, that once uh, facilitated communication kind of took the country by storm, there followed some cases where the facilitated person was uh, accusing, say, a family member or a caregiver of sexual assault. Correct. And it was it was actually a sort of a disproportionate number of times that that started happening, and Correct. so there were these uh, legal cases, and there were expert wit witnesses called in who developed the double blind test. So, for example, um, you might show the facilitator a picture of a cup, and then you would show show the facilitated person a picture of a sneaker, and then ask you know the facilitated person to type out what they saw, and it would always be what the facilitator saw. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, so it was pretty. It was pretty clear that at least in many of these cases, what was being accessed, <laughs> and here we go, was the unconscious thoughts of the facilitator. Correct. And I just wanted to add that um, the professional organizations, American Psychological Association, and Association for Speech and Hearing, have. It, this has been widely discredited uh, as a scientifically valid method for communication uh, because of what Lisa's heading into, because of the potential for projection. Correct. Which was happening right from the beginning. I mean, it didn't yes. take any time at all for those cases to start emerging. It was immediate. And, uh, you know, I, I, I put segments of the front line um, film in, in my film, which was made in 1993. So it was just, you know, and it takes about a year to make a film, right? So they, they mm. immediately started working on uh, this film, which was considered a kind of debunking of the method um, from very, very early on. But it, it, uh, it persists to this day. Um, and, and the accusations uh, through the method of, you know, a disproportionate amount of sexual uh, abuse claims, you know, of, of all the things. Um, those continue to this day as well. There are still cases uh, all over the country happening as we speak. Well, wow. so with, with that real setup, um, let me let me just uh, kind of venture in to some of the territory that I'm hoping we can launch into. Uh, which is, is I watched this and, and Nick, as I've said to you, one of the things that so impressed me was that though, you know, you, I think you, you know, right away at the opening of the film that, that Anna goes to jail for this. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very shocking when Derek is first on the camera, you know, oh, this is the person she did this with, you know, and yet you, you do such a good job in the film, I think of giving her a voice and she's so clearly convinced, uh, you know, that that she and Derek really had a, a love affair. Um, and and you just do a wonderful job of holding open that space that, um, you know, it, I didn't I didn't feel uh, I didn't feel sure about what I thought until toward the end. Um, and, and I think that once you do get to the end, there is there is a lot of outrage, you know, there is like. How the you know how the heck could she do that? What was she thinking? Um, my God, how naive! I mean, there's there's a there's a I can just kind of feel that in myself, and I'm sure in the kind of discourse around the film, there's just like a lot of shock, you know, that that she would she would do this because, um, you know, she did she did you know bring him to her office and and uh, 
and have sex with him. So, um, but, but I, what I was left with, what was reverberating for me was as someone in the helping profession, how aware I am of how susceptible we all are to what we would call counter-transference, our own kind of thoughts and fantasies about the person that we're working with. And all of us, but especially those of us in the helping professions, um, can be susceptible to developing a savior complex, which can uh, really um, uh, distort reality for us. So I, I found myself, you know, horrified and shocked, but at the same time thinking, wait a minute, <laughs> I, I know that place too. I think it's essential for me as a filmmaker that people ask themselves those questions. You know, I was starting to say um, before we hit record that, you know, um, I, I didn't set out to make a film that was shocking. You know, that's not what interested me about the film. What interested me about the film was that it was a, uh, an extreme human experience that had a lot to reveal about our own potential and, and, you know, um, down to <laughs> the, just the very idea of relationships and love, right? That was one big element I was interested in the beginning as to what degree do we all project onto the person we're with, right? I mean, to, to what degree are we, are we yeah. with, with the person, the real person who is the other person? And to what degree are we with or hoping to be with the person that we, we want them to be? And 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 how that confusion leads to so much turmoil and conflict in some relationships, you know, not speaking personally, of course, I don't have any of those problems. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I was, I was interested in it for those reasons. There's a reasons why we have all the mythology around that, too. You know, I, I thought about Pygmalion, you know, uh, very early on. I was like, well, if this is, you know, if this is a love, a love story in quotes, right, what kind of a love story is it? it, it and... Um, I went in with a real open mind and a lot of curiosity about it because I thought it had the story had so many things to teach us all. And sometimes when you take extreme stories, you know, it's a little bit easier to kind of see the kind of tentacles of those stories dangling in our lives and, and how easy it might be to, to latch on to one of them and get to a place that we never imagined we might get to, you know, if we're not, if we're sort of not careful or thoughtful or checking in with ourselves and, and, and others. And, I think what happened in this case also was that they kept, you know, the relationship was very private, right? Um, yes. For so long. And in that privacy, which lasted almost two years, you know, privacy and, and, and the sort of secretive nature of it can be a context for, for all kinds of, of things to start happening that may or may not have been there, right? It's a, such a good point. Uh, it's just that one-on-one -on -one relationship in any kind of a, a helping profession, uh, you, if, if the analogy that Jung uses is that you put the, the two people, their personalities, in an alchemical vase. And if, if the elements combine, uh, both people are changed. Uh, and people bring their own projections, their own complexes, the helper. Especially in this case, because Derek was so impaired, he could not speak. Uh, and uh, so in a way, he's a very much a blank screen, which creates the conditions uh, for projection. Right. I mean, I think, um, you know, it's interesting. He's, if, we, if we just... <laughs> it gets very complicated, you know, especially when you get into the, the disability side of it, because he was, he could, you know, he could not communicate verbally, right? And I think it's just really important to sort of remind people that, you know, Deva Kastnitz, who's one of the people in the film who is a, she has a, something called torsion dystonia, and she's one of the main characters in the film. She was at trial. She uh, has a, a, a PhD. She taught in, in Berkeley for many, many years. You know, she would say the majority of our communication is nonverbal anyway, right? And, and she wasn't saying that as a way to sort of 
um, let everybody off the hook, but it was just to make the point that, you know, let's just make sure we understand that the, 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 how, how fundamental uh, and verbal communication is to our perception of reality, right? But that that's one layer of it. And I'm only saying that, which is to say that, you know, Derek, as much as he is a blank slate, he is also a full and sort of total person of his own, right? That is bringing um, a very different kind of life experience to the table. And, and that produces I- its own alchemy, as, as what you're saying, that is quite different than the one that we're used to, right? And, and um, so I, I, I only say that not as a sort of like a correction, but just to sort of say that, um, you know, he was bringing things to the table. And I, as a filmmaker, am also interested in that that mystery, right? And I had I had a I had a dis- disability consultant who was a he was a black artist and advocate from San Francisco, also with cerebral palsy, and he helped remind me that part of what we were trying to understand was what did Derek experience? What did he bring to the table? Whether he was intellectually impaired or not, what ex- what did he feel from this? That's an important question that I think audiences are left in the film: is what did he experience? Yeah. What was your sense of that after your exploration and consultation with an expert of Derek's experience? You know, I think even even uh, I would only quote uh, the film. um, There's a gentleman, Howard Shane, who uh, assesses Derek for trial and determines that he, you know, could probably did not have the ability to type and and didn't have the uh, sorry, I should say, did not have the intellect to type. Um, but had the physical ability to type. That's sort of an interesting thing in, in, in and of itself. But he would say, you know, I don't, he wouldn't claim to know what Derek was experiencing. I don't think he would ever assess that. I think everyone, you know, what he, I think, did correctly was stay in his lane, which was as a clinician, he was very much testing for very particular things. You know, can this, does this person have the ability to use a device? And, and that's all. He stopped there and he stopped short of making any assumptions about what, what might have occurred and what level of, of consent, if any, there was that was not expressed. And I would sort of, you know, it's not to sort of cop out, uh, you know, or, 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 you know, but I, I would sort of, I would plead the fifth as well on making a statement about what he was experiencing. I don't think that's fair of me. You know, I think that's a question I want people to, I want, I want it to bother people, you know, at the end of the film, I want it to agitate people, you know. That was uh, remarkably and poignantly successful. Uh, it, is, it is a very agitating film and necessarily so. The, the polarities are not resolved. Right. And the film challenges us to hold all these tensions uh, about race and consent and disability and power and communication and all of it leaves us, I think, really wrestling with all these questions instead of the, you know, the false comfort of here are the answers, the answers. Uh, And Lisa made a point earlier on that I think is really salient, which is um, let's think about where all these issues reside in us around power and consent, communication, projection, because of, you know, what Jung says is that we first get to know someone and, and many life dynamics through projection. That's, our, that's what draws us to someone or to an experience. And then hopefully we can reflect and differentiate between that person or that experience and self rather than merging with it uh, as. Anna may have done. And that's very much part of analytic training of what's me and what is the you who sits in our consulting room. Yeah. And I think it, 
that's where the ethics of it get tricky because you know one could say that you know it is our it is our responsibility to take on the challenge of that of that differentiation and that process right and and if we don't um it, it, we we we're we're not we're not being responsible right and i think that in this case that's that's obviously it's a very has has a lot of the stakes are very high it's a very complicated issue also because in the United States, there is a history of forced sterilization of people who had uh, mental disabilities. There are legal battles that are still happening as to whether, for instance, two people with Down syndrome should be together, should they have children, can there be a legal marriage if there is a sense of um, not full understanding? And of course, in some places that is. Um, happening and supported by family. So there is a larger issue of how we perceive the vulnerable other and how in the context of the parental dynamic, whether literally, as Daisy was Derek's parent, or whether the state, the government, thinks of themselves as the parents of the eternal children of the culture those who do not appear to age um, psychologically or mentally, and, and how much power should the parental energy, the parental images, the parental context exert over their children. And, and that's a dynamic that's very present in the documentary that Daisy, of course, wants to protect him and loves him, but she's also appalled that he's ever been exposed to sexuality. That she thinks of that as she says in the documentary, well, you know, basically once you let that cat out of the bag, you know, now my child is knows about this and you know, what are we gonna do about that? So what we can also see in Daisy's projection is that he is the eternal child. He he has to be kept in a state of innocence. And that Anna has come like the serpent into the Garden of Eden and robbed my son of his innocence. And she and Derek's brother both have that sense that Anna is evil for having corrupted the innocence of Derek. And that is a, a very ancient, archetypal feeling that 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 is in the collective and, and understandable, but it complexifies the legal standing of what's also happening. And there is a way in which, and this is less, of course, about Derek, but we can fall into a malignant worship of innocence and a, a almost perverse um, obsession with maintaining innocence, and whether that's even in the United States now, parents deciding their children should have no sex education in public schools, that we, we do have a very bizarre relationship with the archetype of innocence, and that is rumbling around under the surface in the whole documentary and in the discourse. I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. None. I'll pass. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, listen, it, it's fascinating, and, and it, gets into, it gets into territory that um, is, is, is tricky for me as a filmmaker. So we can talk. I, I'm going to just, uh, I'll let it rip, and, and then we can talk, as you said, Lisa, uh, about, you know, uh, the editing. But <clears throat> the question of uh, infantilization, right? is um, something that is an extremely um, heated point in, in the disability space. It is Deva Kastnitz, who has a PhD in you know, uh, anthropology and disability studies, will walk into an elevator of a Barnes & Nobles and people will baby talk to her still. Oh, all right. um, it I is, thought she was extraordinary oh, in the she documentary. Is, Just she extraordinary. She, she's, I always said she's kind of like the Greek chorus, right? Um, 
she kind of pulls us out to a different level and says, here's how you might want to think about this chapter. And then, you know, sort of gently lets us back into the story. And because she has an experience in a point perspective that none, most audiences will not have and, and not understand. Um, so, but this idea that this is also the thing that I think is very triggering for people as they watch is that Anna at certain points of the film, who some people will have decided she's, you know, is a villain uh, early or later in the story at various different points of the story. You can't deny that she guides us through some of this very uncomfortable terrain of trying to differentiate when infantilization is happening, when it's not appropriate. And the fact that he is not a child, he is a it's very, very important to understand why not just his mother rejects the sex of it. And we could talk, there's so many reasons why one would, but, but also the jury, which is kind of a, a, a proxy for the audience, who their only view of, of, of Derek as a, as a person was that he was walked through the courtroom one day and then walked out the door. And Deva says, you know, I think the, the, the verdict happened in that moment. And that was like the, sec- the first or second day of the trial, which lasted two weeks. When people saw him, it was unimaginable that somebody like him could be sexual. And it was unimaginable to them that Anna could have sexual desire for him. And that his mother, who had walked him through the courtroom, um, and showed him, so to speak, to the judge and the jury, was, was this was her child in that moment. And, uh, and that, that, that's just, you know, no matter how you feel about the story, that those, those forces were very, very present in, in the courtroom, and I think they're present in the documentary as people watch it. And, um, you know, there are people that identify with Daisy, and, that there, and there are people uh, who, who have a real issue with that. You know, and, and I think both are valid things to explore. Uh, um, and to what degree does um, the allowance for self-determination then present more vulnerability in his life, right? And, and when do you intervene in that process? You know, these are incredibly difficult things for, for people to negotiate. And, and I think that that, for me, is what makes the story a tragedy more than anything else because you can have you can have you know four or five people all doing their best to ne- negotiate terrain that is frankly unexplored in so many ways and you can you can it can still end in tragedy and that that is that's what i think happened here and that's what, why i think it's important it's just an important story for us to consider generally. What about, what about Anna's innocence? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a question of um, the ethics of, you know, do good intentions make you innocent? And, right, I, I don't... Yeah, exactly. That's extremely... In the courtroom, it doesn't matter, right? Um, and I think Although that... Although intention, that, yeah. does intent to do harm does matter, but... Deva, in uh, the uh, consultant there, yeah. had used the word naive, which is a form of the way we say that an adult who looks like they should be more mature is acting in a way that is oddly innocent of, of various factors, if nothing else, even the factor around the family dynamics that she could kind of trundle up there and tell mom and the brother, you know, we're in love, and, and expect this perhaps to be celebrated is really good news. That, again, she, she was uh, encapsulated in a romantic fantasy um, that made her vulnerable. But I, I want to go a little deeper into the idea of innocence. And again, not taking any position about the documentary itself, that the loss of innocence is the central mythology of Western religion. It is, it is the great primal sin. It is the original sin. Adam and Eve are 
and we're talking on an archetypal level, Adam and Eve are living like children in the Garden of Eden, as innocent as every creature, and then they become self-aware, and the first thing they become self-aware of is their nakedness, their genitalia, which they hide. And there they are, you know, hiding in the shrubbery in the Garden of Eden. And God's like, where are you? And one could say that the first sin is hiding. And so much of that archetypal tension is constellated in the story with Anna. This idea of Anna, you know, awakening uh, Derek, so to speak, to the idea of um, being of nakedness and sexuality, and then even the hiding from quote unquote God, the hiding from the massive authority, which then threatens to throw them out of this. Edenic relationship in the Edenic world for Derek, of course, is to be ever cared for by his devoted, rather wonderful mother, for sure. And so I think the audience cannot help but be influenced by something that is so central to the mythology of, of Christianity and Judaism, for that matter. So it is very difficult, as you were saying, to see Derek you know, as, as a discreet human being having his own very complicated and often inscrutable experiences. So as Jungians, we're very interested in this idea of archetypal activation. And I suspect that's one of the reasons that stories like this, but this story in particular, is so, so capturing to uh, the minds of, of the Judeo-Christian world, for that matter. And the difficulty, of course, is that when an archetypal pattern is activated in the collective, people's quality of consciousness reduces. And that's exactly what you're talking about, that when Derek was walked through the court and not engaged in any way, um, that a, an archetypal field is captured and that the judge herself was captured in that, deciding what information was even permitted that, to be presented, even deciding that the jury can't even know certain things. So this um, stupefying power of archetypal constellation is happening, and so many people are getting caught in that. And Anna, of course, plays the role of the serpent. That's, that's a really rich, interesting take, Joseph. And as usual, with a lot of what you say, it's like I had not even considered that. Um, and, but I want to pick up on, on it and then just take it in a slightly different direction because I, you know, I'm so glad you brought in this idea about archetypal activation. I think there were, I think there were multiple archetypes mm -hmm. at work and definitely the one you're talking about. and also. For Anna, I think that so we were in the archetypal field of the savior. And, and there's, there's a few things about that. First of all, the savior complex often constellates what's known in transactional analysis as Karpman's drama triangle. So if you know about the drama triangle, there's a victim, there's an oppressor or a victimizer or persecutor, and there's the rescuer. And, and we have that here, right? Like, in, in, in Anna's view, Derek was the victim of Daisy's kind of smothering and, and maybe society's generally kind of discounting him for multiple factors. Um, Daisy was at least the stand-in persecutor, and she was the rescuer. She was going to come in and rescue him. And one of the, pro I mean, the, the, as the, the transactional analyst will point out, the drama triangle creates problems. <laughs> It's a problematic dynamic, relational dynamic. But, but from our view, one of the things about it is, uh, and it, I think it also goes to, to Anna's naivete, when we're naive, when we're innocent, we are uh, identifying with an archetype and we're splitting off knowledge of the other part. 
So she's identifying, you know, unconsciously, she's in identification with this archetype of the savior. And the shadow aspect of that, the shadow aspect of the savior is the charlatan. And she had really, really split herself off from that. And that's entirely relevant because as we've already said, by the time she begins using facilitated communication with Derek, it had been debunked for like almost two decades. So, you know, the, you know, was, was, was Anna a savior or was she a charlatan? Those are, those are two, two aspects of, of the archetype. I, I'm going to introduce another aspect here, <laughs> yes. uh, which is um, transgression. Uh, that is also embedded in uh, the myth of as Adam and Eve. And when is transgression in the service of, of growth? When is it the right thing to do to break the rules? And many a fairy tale has examples of transgression being necessary and examples of transgression uh, leading people to a bad end. And I think we're circling around the crucial importance of consciousness as much as any of us ever can bring consciousness uh, to a certain situation. That, that, that is our, our only and best way truly forward out, out of all of these archetypal realities. <laughs> there, there's so there's so much there. I mean I love I want to just let you guys roll to be honest with you but, <laughs> well we you know Nick we could <laughs> yeah no, and please you know please feel free to, to just riff off each other because that that's what you all do so well and and you're you're you know you're obviously so qualified to to analyze in this way I I, mm-hmm. I think that um the things that uh I think are, I'm just going to point out a couple things from the different things that I've heard, which are, I think are important. And one is um, to go back a little bit, you know, during the disclosure in the film, um, it, is, it is not totally clear how much doubt the family had about the method itself at that point. But what was kind of... Um, what really, really shot to the surface and became the kind of upheaval of the story was that sex had entered the story. Right. So which came first, right? That the doubt about the individual self-determining person that was Derek or the sexualized Derek and which was more of an offense to the reality of of the Johnson family. And I, it's sort of an unclear, it's not completely clear to me. I think that they might say that there were doubts about the method and that there was a kind of a colliding of the, of the two things and that this, this, this sort of the sexual relationship uh, confirmed those doubts. But there, there is the reality that on its own, the sexual nature of the relationship is what really did create the downfall, right, of, of the rest of the story and the sort of the, the cascade of of, uh, of, of, you know, the legal and all the things that happened afterwards. So I think that's an important thing to sort of understand also is when the innocence was, uh, became corrupt, uh, everybody went into a very high state of activation and, uh, and, and action at that point, right, to sort of... Um, gain back the innocence to protect the child um and to villainize the predator right in that in that moment before any analysis was done about uh whether or not he might have been communicating or not right so i think that's just an important detail to sort of to sort of throw out there is that it's the, the order of events and i think it relates to some some of the stuff you guys are talking about but um you know, Anna, another thing to say is that Anna and most people in the facilitated communication community will say, oh, I know that there's the possibility of influence 
I know that uh, how my 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 subconscious works. I I'm smart enough to I've studied this stuff. I understand that it's possible that I've entered the story at various moments and that um but I I watched out for that. I made sure that I triangulated responses that I brought somebody else into the room and said, "You know, Derek mentioned that they were, you know, he's saying what I think is that he was at the gym today if I'm reading the word the letters GM correctly. Is that right?" Uh, Oh, yes, Daisy told me, yes, he had been to the gym that day. That's amazing, you know, and he 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 seemed very excited according to his his aides at the adult daycare center. Um, oh, okay, well, that confirms I'm on the right track, right? So she would say, of course, there's influence. Of course, I, I have, there's the, 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 the idea of projection, right? Um, but but I made sure that wasn't happening at various various points, right? And and so you know I, I talked to some people in the community who admittedly uh, when I say the community, the facilitated communication community, who admittedly uh, some somebody in I think in Wisconsin I spoke to who runs a, a center out there said seventy percent of the time it is faulty. Now, based on those statistics alone, one might say, well, that's why the method was debunked and it shouldn't be used because that's a high percentage. And then she would say in response, well, what about the 30% of the time, you know, and do we just throw the baby out with the bathwater in the absence of another method that can, that can keep pace with the kind of communication we're unlocking in people that are otherwise missed to the corner of the room, mm -hmm. or to mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. right? What I didn't hear from Anna is exactly what you just pointed out. Uh, just now, which is that people will say, uh, yes, uh, there is very much the possibility of influence and projection. And it may even happen a lot, but not always. So here we have uh, both sides being presented. I did not hear in the film that Anna reflected on her shadow of perhaps I did misunderstand. Uh, perhaps I was caught. Um, in the excitement of trying to unlock uh, Derek, um, I did not hear any self-doubt whatsoever, uh, which to me indicates really being caught in a complex, the savior part of the Cartman's triangle. She, I think, uh, so I, I would say two things about that. One is you're, you're correct. And towards the end of the film, I asked her straight out if there was ever a moment at any point of the first meeting Derek all the way through the trial that she had doubts about what might have happened. And she says, resoundingly, no, there are no, no doubts. And, um, and then when I asked Daisy the same question, do you think that Anna believed that she was communicating? Daisy says something very interesting. She says, yeah, in her wicked mind, right? Which, I, which is a very quick response, and the edit sort of moves on fairly quickly from it, but it's, it's quite, quite profound because there's an acknowledgement that I did believe, but also that it was wicked. It was evil, right? Um, we have that archetypal world that's just spinning around in, in people's minds understandably and and in a way influencing the fate of this event yeah the other thing that i would point out just uh, quickly is something that's hard to get across in a film that is moving at the same pace from minute one to 102 is there's a time period of two years happening here and within that time period when you look at the printouts of the NEO, because the NEO, which is the machine that they typed on, it, it, it preserves in its memory everything that was typed into it unless you actively delete it, throw it in the trash in your computer. When you look at those printouts, it's pages and pages and pages of single words that are meaningless. So, sorry, single letters that are meaningless. They become two words. Uh, two, sorry, two letters, which becomes a, a misspelled word that is somewhat recognizable, that then becomes a word that is misspelled but clear what the word is, to two-word se uh, sentences, to four-word sentences, to 
essays. And that this takes place over two years, which doesn't sound long, but to understand how you get caught in the web of letters, it's, it's a process that is so deeply embedding that once you get to the point where you're reading the essay, it, it makes the idea of, of pulling back and to un- unravel it and just unlock it, right? And to sort of say, oh, okay, I was in the wrong reality during that moment, right? I mean, not only is that difficult, but it's, it's, it's terrifying. Mm. Terrifying thing to then to, to admit and walk back from. So, you know, that's all. It's just to say when you add down to something that's actually coherent, that this was a process that happened over time and that that's really something I think people need to consider and is hard to capture in a moving picture, right? That is only right. 90 minutes long. So, so what you're talking about, I'm, I'm going to use the word kind of a seduction. And it, it leads me into one of the things that I find really fascinating about the film that I want to lift up is about the nature of our relationship with the unconscious. So at one point in the frontline film, you know, they used the term, what was actually being tapped into was the, I think it was in the frontline piece segment. Um, uh, what's actually being tapped into is the unconscious thoughts of the facilitator. And then uh, Sh- Shane, is that his name? Shane says she fell in love with herself. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, at some points, Anna says something like, well, I knew I wasn't influencing him because he was disagreeing with me. And I was like, oh, she thinks that just because there is a contrary voice that that no, it's like, well, the un yeah, the unconscious, the unconscious is actually other. That's the thing. And our process of projection is unconscious. So for so for for anyone doing facilitated communication to say, well, I understand there can be projection, and because I because I'm aware of that, it won't happen. That's not how it works. And I, I'm saying that as someone who sits with people and uh, tries to be aware of my own projections and the unconscious is unconscious, you know? So, and, and I, and I also think it's really fascinating and, and there's something, I mean, if it didn't have such a potentially really damaging outcome for all involved, it would be, um, well, let's put it this way. You brought up Pygmalion, which I loved that you brought up that reference. And for those of you that don't know that story, it's a, Greek myth about uh, a man who spurned women. He didn't have the patience for women, but then he he started trying to craft. He was a sculptor, and he started trying to craft like the ideal woman. And he spent so much time working on it, and he made he made this this sculpture of this beautiful woman, and he fell absolutely in love with her. And then Aphrodite takes pity on him and brings her to life. But it's it is the way that we can pour our soul in an, in an unconscious process into, into something, either, uh, you know, perhaps a, an artistic, uh, you, know, I, I rem, um, you know, I remember uh, Leo Tolstoy, I think at one point says that he fell in love with, uh, he fell in love with Anna Karenina. Um, you know, even though he, he started off thinking she was, you know, a kind of a, um, a, a villain, or, or at least a fallen woman, but then there he was, he fell in love with her. And we can, all, we can all do this. We can fall in love with ourselves. And as long as we sort of know that that's what's happening, it can be a really beautiful, revivifying process. And I think, you know, Nick, you were talking about this is what happens in love relationships. Well, yes, it is. We, and, and, and Jung said this, you know, that, that limerence phase that falling in love phase is about projecting our own, uh, um, the, the sort of our own inner unrealized potential onto the partner. And in our world, we call that anima when it's a man and animus when it's a woman. And you could say that uh, Anna Stubblefield projected her animus onto Derek and she says, you know, I'm a nerdy intellectual girl and I want a nerdy intellectual guy. And that's what Derek is. You know, she projected her, her, her own inner beloved onto him. Um, and, but, but, but again, we, we, it's hard to, it's hard to understand how autonomous the unconscious is. So there's, 
there's this um, term, I think I have the term right, idiomotor. So when you're holding someone's hand, it's, it's a lot like the Ouija board, right? You've got a couple hands on the planchette and it's driving around the board, spelling out these uncanny things. And everyone's like, I'm not moving it. Or, or automatic writing is the same kind of phenomenon where we don't consciously, we're not intentionally moving it, but we are kind of giving an avenue to our unconscious. So I, I, I guess I'm probably rambling about this, but it's really poignant to me that, that Anna did this and it's kind of really irresponsible too. So holding the both hands. If you could, if you could sort of accuse her of willfully ignoring some of the evidence, it is somehow this idea that a argument with yourself is not, or is proof that you somehow had, it couldn't have, you know, you, it, that it had to be true because people don't argue with themselves. But, and I think if you were to have any other conversation with her in any other context, she would say, of course, we're at, our, you know, we're at conflict with ourself all the time. But context of this, it just didn't make any sense. There's another story where, you know, they, they go to see a movie and they're at dinner. And this, I think, was written about in the, the, the article uh, in 2015. Um, but she orders a glass of wine. And, and then, according to her, Derek says, I, I'm, I'm not comfortable with you having a glass of wine because aren't you driving home tonight? And she says, well, it's just one glass. I can handle a glass of wine. And they have another argument about whether one glass of wine is too much. And so she, she eventually says, listen, I'll, I'll do it for you. I'll, I'll, I'll cancel the order because I don't want you to feel uncomfortable. And she would say, why would I, why would I argue with myself? Why would I deny myself a glass of wine uh, if I wanted a glass of wine and, and knew that I could, you know, knew that I could drive? Why, why would I do that to myself? Right. And it's the same as the argument that they had classroom. So I mean, there's a number of examples which for her were confirming examples of their communication. And which I think that what you're getting at is that um, it, it's, it's not at all evidence of confirmation. In fact, it's, it's just evidence of how complicated the, this, this yeah. is. I mean, usually the unconscious is at odds to some degree with the conscious mind. You know, we're, we're all always kind of in this state of, of inner conflict. And, and, and also, you know, the, the big lesson for, for me, I think, which is almost one of the most profound ones in the age of social media, um, is that, you know, the responsibility to not only look at things that are confirming of your reality, but to also look at things that question it and you question your perception, right? And there's an enormous responsibility there. And I think, in, you know, this this film show, shows uh, how important that is and the stakes for just a, a couple people and a family. But, mm -hmm. you know, you extrapolate that out and you sort of zoom out and you see the, how much sort of simultaneous confirmation bias is happening all the time, right? And it feels kind of terrifying to me, right? I mean, yeah. I don't want to bring us down the rabbit hole of social media because any conversation can go there, strangely. But it is, it is really important to me that that um the that one of the lessons is that you can't just look for confirmation i mean that's not the point right like um e even in the scientific community i was making a film about um a, a woman at princeton who was trying to uh, question whether the fifth extinction was actually an asteroid she believed it was volcanoes and she had a, a graduate student um who was helping her do the work and he said you know the problem is many scientists try to prove their theories but i try to prove my theory is wrong. My theory can withstand the scrutiny of that. Um, then I know it's a, it's a good theory. You know, then I know it has legs and I can continue on with it. So how many people are, are you know, if, this, if scientists in many fields are not doing that, how, how many, how, you know, can we count on the average person to, to hold themselves to that standard? You know, it's, it's an incredibly high standard. And I think it's too easy to just point the finger at Anna and say, Oh, you didn't do that. You know, we all do that. You didn't do that. We're virtuous out here. And boy, did you cross the line in there. And I would never do that. And I think that the interesting conversation is more about how easy it is to do that, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that not only do we project the secret beloved onto other people, but that the secret beloved is configured 
very specifically in each person. So there is something inside of Anna that is seeing her own beloved locked in, trapped, encapsulated, and and this this remarkable, overwhelming barrier between her and her own spirit, really, which is how Jung would interpret it, and the great lengths that she is willing to go to um, release. And now this shows up in fairy tales all the time when the beloved is under a curse. Beauty and the Beast, any number of other curses in there, in some of the other uh, non-European fairy tales, the beloved is cursed into muteness. In the myth of uh, Echo, Echo is, is a nymph who's punished by Hera, so that the only thing she can do is repeat the other person's last words. You know, so the beloved could also be <laughs> configured as Echo. See, he's re- this echoing is going back and forth, but it's a sign of love. But I, I would love to take a moment, if you'll allow me to be just a Jungian and not a social commentarist, and I would love to read a very ancient love story to constellate a certain archetype in our conversation. And I want to say to our listeners, this is not in any way um, suggesting that what happened was moral or right. But as Jungians, we're always trying to diagnose the deeper and deeper levels of the psyche that we are all vulnerable to. And by bringing consciousness to it, we then can experience a sense of freedom. So there's the story of Pyramus and Thisbe, which is thought to be um, an old Babylonian love story that is recounted only in Ovid's Metamorphosis. And there are some uncanny um, images that unfold in this story that remind me just too much uh, of, of what's happening. And I, I think it might be worth pondering. Pyramus and Thisbe, he the loveliest youth and she the most sought-after girl, lived in neighboring houses in the towering city of Babylon that the Samirius is said to have enclosed with walls of brick. Enclosed. Their nearness and their first childhood steps made them acquainted and in time, love appeared. The nearness made love appear. They would have agreed to swear the marriage oath as well, but their parents prevented it. They were both on fire, with hearts equally captivated, something no parent can prevent. They had no one to confide all this to. Nods, and signs were their speech. And the more they kept the fire hidden, the more it burned. So we have this remarkable archetypal setup where, just as it was with Anna and Derek, nods, signs are interpreted as declarations of of burning love. There was a fissure, a thin split in the shared wall between their houses, which traced back to when it was built, and no one had discovered the flaw in all those years. But what can love not detect? You lovers saw it first and made it a path for your voices. Your endearments pass that way, in safety, in the gentlest of murmurs. Often when they were in place, Isby here and Pyramus there, and they had each caught the sound of the other's breath. They'd said, unfriendly wall, why do you hinder lovers 
how hard would it be for you to let our whole bodies meet? And if that is too much, perhaps to open to the kisses we could give each other. Not that we are ungrateful. We confess that we owe it to you that words are even allowed to pass to loving ears. So there's, there they are, you know, with the keyboard, like a crack between two walls and murmurs and whispers. So they talk, hopelessly, sitting opposite. Hang as night fell, farewell, each touching the wall with kisses that could not reach the other side. One morning, when Aurora had quenched the fires of night and the sun's rays had thawed the frosty grass, they came to their usual places. Then they decided, first with a little murmur of their great sorrows, to try in the silence of night to deceive the guards and vanish outside. Once out of the house, they would leave the city as well, and they agreed, in case they went to stray, crossing the open country, to meet by the grave of Ninus and hide in the shelter of a tree. And there was a tall mulberry tree there, dense with white berries bordering a cool fountain. They were satisfied with their plan, and the light, slow to lose its strength, was drowned in the waters. And out of the same waters the night emerged, carefully opening the door. Thisbe slipped out, deceiving her people came to the tomb, her face veiled, and seated herself under the tree they had agreed on. Love made her brave. But a lioness, fresh from the kill, her jaws foaming, smeared with the blood of cattle, came to slake her thirst at the nearby spring. In the moonlight, Babylonian Thisbe Sees her, some way off and flees in fear to a dark cave, and as she flees she leaves behind the fallen veil when the fierce lioness has drunk deeply. Returning towards the trees, she chances to find the flimsy fabric without its owner and rips into it with her blood-stained jaws. Daisy? Leaving the city, a little later, Pyramus sees the creature's tracks in the thick dust and his face is drained of color, and when he discovers the veil stained with bloody cries, two lovers will be lost in one night. She was the more deserving of a long life. I am the guilty spirit. I have killed you, poor girl, who told you to come by night to this place filled with danger and did not reach it first. Oh, all you lions that live amongst these rocks, tear my body to pieces and devour my sinful flesh in your fierce jaws, though it is cowardly to ask for death. He picks up Thisbe's veil and carries it with him to the shadow of the tree they had chosen, kissing the token and wetting it with tears, and he cries, Now be soaked with my blood too. Having spoken, he drove the sword he had been given into his side, and dying pulled it warm from the wound as he laid back again on the ground. The blood spurted out like a pipe, fracturing at the weak spot in the lead and sending long bursts of water hissing through the spit, cutting through the air beat by beat, sprinkled with blood the tree's fruit turned a deep blackish red, and the roots soaked through also imbued the same overhanging mulberries with the dark purplish color. Now Thisbe returns, not yet free of fear, lest she disappoint her lover, and calls for him with her eyes and in her mind, eager to tell him about the great danger she has escaped. Though she recognizes the place and the shape of the familiar tree, the colors of the berries puzzles her. She waits there. Perhaps this is it. Hesitating, she sees the quivering limbs writhing in the blood-stained earth and stares back, terrified, like the sea. That trembles when the slightest breeze touches its surface, her face showing whiter than boxwood. But when, staying a moment longer, she recognizes her lover, she cries, out loud with grief, striking at her innocent arms and tearing at her hair, cradling the beloved body, she bathes his wounds with tears, mingling their drops with blood, blending kisses on his cold face, and she cries out, Pyramus, 
what misfortune has robbed me of you? Pyramus, answer me. You dearest, your dearest Thisbe calls to you. Obey me, lift your fallen head. Tell them you love me. Wow. At Thisbe's name, Pyramus raised his eyes, darkened with death, and having looked at her, buried them again in darkness. When she recognized her veil and saw the ivory scabbard and without its sword, she said, Unhappy boy, your own hand and your love have destroyed you. I too have a firm enough hand for once, and I too love. It will give me strength in my misfortune. I will follow you to destruction, and they will say I was a most pitiful friend and companion to you. He could only be removed from me by death. Death cannot remove. Nevertheless, I ask for both of us in uttering these words, O oh, our poor parents, mine and his, do not deny us the right to be laid in one tomb, we whom certain love and the strangest hour have joined, and you the tree that now covers the one poor body with your branches and soon will cover two, retain the emblems of our death. And always carry your darkening fruit in mourning, a remembrance of the blood of us. And thus, the mulberry is the documentarist. And saying this and placing the point under her heart, she fell forward on the blade. And of course, agrees to be interviewed and tells her whole story. <laughs> <laughs> Still warm with his blood, and her prayer moved the gods and stirred her parents' feeling for the color of the berry is blackish red, when fully ripened and what was left from the funeral funeral pyres rests in a single urn. And this is, if Ovid is correct, this in, predates the ancient Greeks. Very, very ancient story. And it's, it's the story that Anna thought she was living out. Exactly. Yeah. Without knowing it, of course, because right. these themes, we're all born with these themes in us. Mm -hmm. And when certain factors um, um, activate, when certain energies start moving inside, an archetypal theme can activate. And when an archetype activates, it defines your sense of reality. Mm -hmm. yep. And it is reality. So whether the mother's archetypal theme is, you know, the serpent has entered the garden and now we need a flaming cherub there at the gate because Eden needs to be, you know, defended in innocence. And now she and her son are on an, a journey of redemption because innocence must be restored or the woman being captured by the story of Pyramus and Thisbe, the story of love created by murmurs and whispers. Star-crossed lovers, yeah. And the typing is such a perfect way to capture the, the whispering mm -hmm. nods and murmurs that are sure to be signs of love. Mm -hmm. So this, this goes to say that, yes, we are in the material world responsible, of course, for our actions. And there are overwhelming powerful forces that guide human souls and shape how we interpret and the meanings that we make. And yes, if Anna had been able to have a symbolic way of thinking, she might have been saved from this, but so few People are even aware of what symbolic thinking means. And, and, and I want to, Joseph, like, like, thank you for that. And I, and I want to just like take that a step further because I think like who, I mean, you know, I'm human. I've had people come to my, my office falling in love, say, with someone inappropriate. Okay. I'm thinking I've had that walk into my office so many times and, you know, y y you what we want to do is we want to sit and we want to listen and say, tell me, tell me what's so wonderful about this 
you know, a uh, married guy who actually doesn't seem to be noticing you at all or whatever it is, you know, I mean, that's not what I say. What I say, well, wow, this sounds really important. Tell me about it, you know. And um, it, it's, so, it's, so, uh, it's so important to kind of let that be there, um, honor it, and at the same time, encourage a symbolic understanding of it eventually. Because then, and I feel like this goes back to what I was trying to say before, like it is a beautiful thing to fall in love with yourself. If, and, and often the way that happens first is through projection. We, we see ourselves in maybe say an, an inappropriate or, or unattainable person. And if we can hold it the right way, if we can be helped to hold it symbolically, then it can be healing and transformative. But when it remains something that we're putting on something out there, uh, then, it can, then it can be really destructive and it, it doesn't have the same opportunity to change us and we can kind of do violence to the person that we're projecting onto. Um, I mean, I'm thinking of in the film, you know, she's saying, oh, Derek doesn't like beer, he likes wine. Oh, Derek doesn't like gospel. He likes classical music. You know, then, then, then you're really sort of coercively forcing someone to be what you need them to be. You know, you're forcing them to kind of be a puppet or play a role. I mean, another alternative, and this I think happens, maybe this is the ideal thing, is we fall in love with someone. We're projecting something onto that person. Our love and attention to that person, you know, we don't just project uh, you know, randomly, there's always a hook. And, and Nick, you were talking before about, uh, you know, kind of what did Derek experience? And, and you very poignantly said, like, I don't know, you know, like the, the other person is always kind of a mystery, right? But my, my imagination about Derek is that he's an, essentially a very loving person. I mean, it comes across in how much his family loves him. And, and maybe that's something that captivated Anna. That's something, that was a hook on which she hung her projection, that there was a kind of just goodness of spirit there, just a lovingness. So when, when we project our very best self on the other person, sometimes it can evoke a real response in them. And then what grows out of that is a real relationship where we're truly seeing the other person. Um, but but I don't know that that actually happened in this case. It's, um, I'm just highlighting all that has just been said, I hope, <laughs> uh, which is how, how powerful and autonomous archetypal realities are. And I think sometimes, you know, these Jungians talk about archetypes and so on, and it, it sounds uh, really you know, pretty pie in the sky. But um, the, the myth is a, a vivid example of it, and its relevance and application to what happened between Anna and Derek is, is also very apropos. And then, Lisa, you're talking about how hard it is to render an archetypal reality into one's own human ability to hold it, tell it, reflect on it, uh, without acting it out. And that, that is hard work in a consulting room. When somebody is truly seized with a passion, not just for another person, um, but, you know, for some incredible new venture of, uh, you know, all of a sudden wafting off into some unknown part of the world. Um, it can be any one of a number of things. And it is, it's so powerful. Uh, it's hard to develop uh, an ego position that can really dialogue with it. Well, Nick, I feel like we've done what we usually do when we have exciting guests on is we just talk more than the guest. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I mean, it's, it's absolutely riveting and, you know, there's a part of, 
as a filmmaker, there is a part I, I do believe almost like music where like there are things that are playing through you, right? That you don't always even realize but you tap into and you have the experience enough to, to shape even the things you don't understand sometimes immediately. So it, it takes the critic or the therapist or the, the, you know, to really kind of extend the conversation. So I, I'm riveted and, and it's, and it's wonderful. Um, I think the, the one thing I was going to say is that, um, you know, in the, in the, in the therapist's room and the privacy and the safety of the therapist's room, when you can, as you say, engage with the archetype and act it out and, and unravel it and then sort of come to maybe a reality that is, is, is greater than what, you know, the sum in, in a way that is hopefully healing and transcendent or whatever, whatever it is. You know, the world is not so forgiving, right? The world is very punitive and it is, it is almost impossible to reevaluate ourselves once our story is public, right? And I think that's one of the things that, and how do we unravel and reevaluate something once it's been tried and convicted, right? And I think that um, that's something that happens also when a film like this goes out into the world and receives the attention of so many people that I, I never imagined. I mean, 4 million people watched this the first week that it was out there. Right? Yes. And it, it, it is, you know, in, in the safety of a screening room uh, where I'm presenting it at a festival and I'm answering questions, there is a conversation that happens and an evaluation that is enlightening for people and it is engaging. When a film goes onto a streaming platform like this and is, it is completely out of my hands, it is out of Anna's hands. A social media conversation starts around it that chooses its villains and chooses its victims, and whatever the predominant thread is influences the com you know, if comment number 267 is poignant enough, then comment 268 onward, you know, become um they just reinforce the, 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 you know, who is the villain and who is the victim. And, and the separation into the poles of good and evil become fixed in, in stone in the walls of the myth, right? You go right back to the walls of the myth. And, um, and, there, and, and the fissure is, is closed, <laughs> mm, yeah. to bring it back to the story. Um, and... So like, you know, that's something that is out of my control and I, I've had to accept and it's a strange, I've never been through that before uh, with a film. I've never had it so out of my hands in that way. I want to ask you a question. Why do you think Anna agreed to do the documentary? I, I wondered about that too and her willingness to talk to Daisy over the phone. Falling on her sword. Yes, yeah. exactly. Well, she would, she would say, I mean, listen, I want to I wanna only quote from her because I, I don't want to be too um, presumptuous, but she, things that she has said to me early on was that she was worried about Derek. She felt that he was now sentenced to his own jail cell, that she might be the only advocate left for him on his behalf, right? These were things that I think she, she believes uh, to this day. Uh, she might have changed, you know, she, it may not, she may not feel that it's her fight anymore, right? Rightly so, but, but that I think she still believes that. And I think that um, the reason she, <laughs> I mean, it's complicated to say, but I think the reasons why she did it came from partially a place of no matter what you think of this story, there are things that everyone can learn from it. And I want to participate in that. She is right to shine the light on those, on those projections, right, that are incorrect, on, uh, that, that so much of the world shares, right? That he cannot possibly be in love. He cannot possibly experience pleasure in this way. Um, because he looks like this, because he wears diapers, because he needs his mother, because he is under the guardianship of 
you know, all of these things are, it's right to unpack them and find, um, find our way through it, you know? To complexify something rather than collapse into this good and bad binary, which is really just a defense against the anxious fear of these incredible forces that, that rumble under the ground in humanity. So these knuckleheads that are like, it's right and it's wrong and this is the way it is and it's left and it's right and it's black and it's white. That I mean, I understand we need defenses. People get full of overwhelming anxiety. But where it becomes, I think, just so awful is that the anxiety is so high that if you don't reinforce my defenses, I will destroy you. So um, it's one thing to need to do this for yourself. It's the others that your anxiety is so hard, is so high that you become dangerous to other people. And that's when we start getting this incredible violence, uh, violent use of social media, which is just so perverse. And one of the um, criticisms that, that will be thrown at even our episode today is how dare you understand? How dare you try to understand all parties in this story? You, absolutely not. It's, it's my way. It's this way. It's the way that makes you comfortable and splits everything into these weird little places. But so much of what we do as Jungians and what we do with our podcast and what you have done with your documentary is you have dared to try to understand, dared to understand. I, I'm, I very much appreciate you saying that. I mean, it's, it's, um, there is an accusation, you know, in the, in the world now of who and who not to platform, right? And that's, that's always changing. And it is a sensitive thing. And there is a great responsibility. And I took that responsibility incredibly seriously. But um, you know, I made this, I made a decision that the, the sort of this, the, the, the total story that was made up by all of its parts was of value and that it would be of less value without one character or another. And I, that's just a, a decision I stood by at the very beginning. And, you know, people are, are, are fooling themselves intentionally if they are saying we are not allowed to look at somebody like her. You know, if people were just would allow themselves the curiosity, untainted by the self judgment um, and and the judgment of 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 what what the, you know the sort of the signaling of of virtue, you know, before somebody else gets to it first, if they just allow themselves the curiosity, I think that they'll they'll see that you know the intention of the film is to just boil the the the, the ingredients and let them percolate to the surface so that people can see them and sort of scrutinize them and, and, and wait around together and, uh, and talk to each other. You know, the biggest, the most, uh, the most, um, kind of, uh, satisfying thing is that, as I hear the, about the, when I hear conversations that are happening, people see the film, they talk to their husband, they talk to their wife, they talk to their partner for days afterwards. Those are, that, that's exactly what I want people to do. You know, I, I, I think it would be a disservice to everybody in the, in story, in the story to come down hard with an agenda about how, how you feel, you know? Um, but I, I would say one thing, which is uh, one of the most interesting things that I think Howard Shane says towards the end of the film, which I think is weirdly, maybe the question that has been the itch that I think is the most important itch to scratch, which is, he says, I don't know what was going on between them. Uh, you know, she was, trying to give him a life outside of his mother. Even if you say that that was a good thing, he says, Howard Shane says, it would have been a false life with Anna. And for me, that always stuck right into the heart of, of, the, of, the, of the story because it's what is the false life and what is the true life? That's what integrity is, right? Is doing a life that is not false. Because it goes beyond just what, what, what good or bad might have come out of the story, what lines might have, may or may not have been crossed. It's what is the true life and what is the false life? Yes, you have two women that are, co that are seemingly 
yeah. taking Derek and making him a character Correct, yeah. in their personal um, theater, so to speak. And I, and I don't say that negatively, but you know the, the archetypal drama of the mother's son, and he is cast in a role, and this is the archetypal, for, for Anna, the archetype of the lover who is trapped and cursed and needs to be freed and liberated. But just as I think you're inferring, that both of those are narratives that these powerful, um, clear, potent women are holding. And are either of those narratives capable of granting Derek all the opportunities and resources that might allow him to lead a fuller life? And are we supporting that, right, as a... If this is not something one one can do alone with somebody like Derek. There needs support, needs support from the state, from the technology, from uh, from the values that we choose to prioritize. You know, uh, we need, you know how do we prioritize Derek? Is he an important member of society? That's something that people have to answer before they can allot money towards helping helping his mom or help you know whatever situation. But also, we're all we're all involved. I think you know. You have dared to understand, and I think the film, you know, exploding in this way, uh, is you have dared us to understand the complexity that is never just going to be answered. It that's the that's it. It's complex. And can we be comfortable with that anymore? That's my, my greatest fear is, is the aversion to that that we see, you know? Um, and for me, that's the most courageous thing I feel like I've done is I've, I've planted, you know, my flag with the film to say, you know, it's maybe the most important thing uh, right now, right? you know, rather than being reductive. It's okay to say it's complex, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, thank you so much for joining us on this wild ride. And thank you so much for this wonderful film that you made. It, I know it really uh, affected all of us and lots of other people, too. Well, I can't thank you enough for having me. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a, rare, a rare treat uh, that um, filmmakers don't always get, you know, to take it outside of that space and, and, and into this space. So I appreciate it very much being here. No way. We're, 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 we're looking forward to your, your next yes. project. Thank you. We'll, we will stay tuned. <laughs> we will indeed. Great. I'll keep listening to you guys. It's... Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. To submit a dream, suggest an episode topic, or join our mailing list, visit our website, thisunionlife.com. If you enjoyed this episode, give us five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell to be alerted whenever we upload new videos. And keep up with all things TJL by following us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok.